At a time when global growth forecasts have been downgraded further, many are saying that India is the only shining spot in the world economy. But how credible is the India growth story? Joining us to talk about that is Geeta Gopinath, professor at Harvard University and also the chair at the India Economic Summit. Uh, Geeta, thanks very much for uh, speaking to us here on NDTV. Uh, let me start uh, with the macro picture because the IMF has just uh, revised its uh, global growth forecast downward while actually revising India's growth to 7.6% for the next two years. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of what's happening? Uh, so the IMF has typically been uh, optimistic about global growth, so I think their downgrades are probably you know, going to be further downgraded the next time they, uh, they do this. Uh, India, I mean, if you just compare the numbers, you know, 7% and more in India is quite distinct from the one to a negative rates that we're seeing in many parts of the world. So there is a good reason to see this as, you know, India is in a distinct space. The question is, of course, uh, you know, whether this will continue. Is this something that represents some sort of an inflection point for India? And then we have to be a little careful. I think the a couple, a few things have happened in the last year that have made people become even more optimistic. One is the, the goods and services tax, the GST. Uh, the second is opening up to FDI in, a, in that many sectors. So I think these two, you know, made it sound like it was not just talk, but there was actual action happening. Uh, and so that made pe have made, has made people optimistic. Now the question is whether this will be enough to bring about sustainable growth in India. I think we still have to wait and see. For me, a real turning point will be when I see numbers on domestic investment going up in a sustained way, then I will be feel much more confident about saying that this is now a real turning point. Right. You know, in fact, I was reading somewhere where you said that the focus cannot be solely or primarily on public sector investment or wooing foreign direct investment yes. uh, into, uh, uh, into, into India. And that's, uh, do you think that's been the primary focus of the reform agenda of this government? And uh, does that need to change significantly? I don't think that is their primary focus, but I think that's been the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason is that because, you know, the big large corporations in India still have balance sheet problems. Yeah. Uh, and the banks in India still have their own balance sheet problems. And so unless that gets fixed, you know, you're not going to see the big corporates being able to, to, uh, to invest as much. So th the difference between them and foreign investors is basically foreign investors don't have that balance sheet problem, yeah. which the domestic investors do. So I don't think this is about trying to target foreign investors, but I think it's a fact that they work uh, with different uh, fundamentals. Right, but you know, what's the one factor that you think is holding back uh, private investment? Uh, because apart from the legacy issues and the banks yes. uh, and their stressed assets and so on, there's no demand in the economy as well. Yes. So, so, y so you're right that uh, if you looked at uh, capacity utilization yeah. rates in companies, those were, you know, at, at low levels, and it looked like there was still space. Uh, but the more recent, you know, talking to uh, companies, and uh, the more recent evidence seems to say that that actually is no longer the case. That they are getting closer to their capacity constraint. They're working at about eighty percent capacity. Mm. So now. It is the case that, you know, there is a reason to think that maybe the demand side arguments are, are a little weaker maybe going forward. So how long do you think we're going to have to wait till the CapEx cycle turns? Uh, is it going to be both a factor of the banks coming back uh, into vogue and also demand picking up? And how long will that take? Um, again, I think the fact that first the RBI has decided to cut rates yeah. by 25 basis points. Now that's not going to be enough because there's still a gap between the rate at which you can borrow from the bank and this base rate. And uh, you know, unless there's more transmission of these rates, it's not going to show up. But I get the sense, just looking from the commentary of the, of the RBI governor and the, and the government, that there is going to be more of a, this push on the transmission. Um, there is very much an, uh, an optimism, great optimism in the, in, in the economy. Uh, demand is certainly going up. Then you have these uh, pay commission uh, uh, yeah. revision in, 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 in incomes that's going to happen. Uh -huh. So while I, you know, I can't tell you whether it's going to happen next quarter or the quarter after, and again, we're not, I'm not looking for like a big dramatic change in the rates, yeah. but I want to see the, the derivative to be in the right direction. In fact, how are you reviewing the signals that the RBI has sent given the inflationary pressures are likely to intensify g going forward with GST and also the uh, pay commission effects coming into play? Uh, do you think uh, we're being too dovish too soon? Uh, I want to wait and see until the minutes of the, of the meeting come out. Uh, 25 basis points, I think, is a safe enough number that it's not 
you know, it's not a dramatic uh, cut mm -hmm. in interest rates. I think we can, you know, that nothing to panic about. Uh, but you're right, there are sources of inflationary pressures that, that exist. Uh, you know, commodity prices, what will happen to those uh, is another thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, w I think I would rather wait and see uh, what's happening. It's not, they haven't taken an action that makes me th you know, worry about the direction. But you know, if you were to crystal gaze into, let's say, the next six or eight months, uh, how do you think uh, the interest rate cycle is going to, uh, you know, turn given all of these uh, pressures that we've just spoken about? Yeah, I'm not a fan of crystal gazing. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, at least so far, the way the RBA has functioned, you know, taking into account Raghuram Rajan's uh, time too, uh, they've been very sensitive to the numbers. Mm. So they're going to go and look at the numbers very closely. Uh, with, no, with monsoons being good in most parts of India, not in all parts, but in most parts of India, there's, in, you know, there's the expectation that that would, uh, that would help. And there could be uh, more rate cuts coming uh, in the future. But again, this is going to be data driven. All right, you know, let's talk about the World Economic Forum's competitiveness rankings. And there was a fair up move uh, uh, as far as India was concerned. And yet, there are some concerns that continue to remain in areas such as primary education and health and so on. Do you worry, especially uh, about this in the context of the fact that the agenda of this conference is on inclusive growth? And, uh, you know, is essentially the seven and a half, eight percent filtering down to the real economy? Well, for sure. I think that uh, besides the, you know, our focus on the ease of doing business and all yeah. that, we also need to focus on outcomes in education and healthcare. And we have, I, I'm, you know, I'm afraid that some of the numbers that we see, especially in education, is that learning outcomes have declined. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's never going to, you know, that's just not a good outcome. The other thing is Skill India, yeah. which was meant to upgrade skills and get people more into the job market. Um, the outcomes have not been uh, have not been great. They haven't. In fact, uh, I think there are some statistics that show that job creation has actually dropped under the, the Narendra Modi government. And I'm wondering, you know, if the government realizes the enormity of the importance of this task because we talk about Skill India, we talk uh, talk about jobs, right. but on the ground, right. you know, what's happening? I, I think th uh, they do understand the enormity of it. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid that the outcomes are not being measured very well. I yeah. think this is now very much kind of an input driven s regime where you know, we, we, do we, we do these programs, but it's not very clear that they're effective. Mm. Uh, the other thing is making India too, mm. you know, is still a bit of a dream. It's yeah. uh, mo a lot of the FDI that's come in has gone into the services sector, not into, uh, you know, really making India. So yeah. until that changes, and again, we're at the stage where everybody thinks that this is going to change, but until that happens, you know, it's, uh, we can't be euphoric about everything here. But you know, do you think the structural challenges to the labor markets with things like technology and automation uh, are actually going to be appending the jobs challenge and also things like Make in India? Because, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, many are saying will come as a threat rather than an opportunity to India, which is not uh, ready or doesn't have the coping mechanisms to deal with the kind of structural changes that we're seeing. I mean, every time there's an industrial yeah. revolution, there's always this discussion about yeah. what's going to happen to jobs. Yeah. Every single time it's happened, that's been the case. Yeah. There has been transition periods when uh, you know outcomes are bad, but eventually that's not been the case. It's not as if unemployment rates have been permanently higher or joblessness has been permanently higher. So I think it's very hard at this point to crystal gaze again and say for sure that you know the jobs jobs are going to go down and, and, and there are also reasons. there are global precedents so there are global examples that have shown how technology has you know reduced employment elasticity in many industries yes and you know at a time when we have to get one million people into the workforce every month this sort of wave of technology does come at an inopportune time doesn't it the uh, <laughs> There are, f I mean, there are reasons why. I'm with you, but I'm going to play a bit the devil's advocate and say that uh, there are reasons why there could be a, it could be a positive in terms of jobs, which is the fact that with the cost of communication going down so much, you know, companies are willing to source from many other places too, uh, and that could be another reason why that would help a country like India. Uh, in terms of jobs, I mean, there, while it's it's true that certain traditional sectors maybe are less uh, labor intensive than they used to be. But there's a lot of demand for jobs in the services sector in like healthcare, mm. uh, in, uh, in education, in uh, tourism. I mean, so there are all these 
other possibilities. There's also, you know, disruptive technologies like, uh, you know, Ola and, uh, yeah. and Uber, where people are becoming self-employed yeah. and they're driving cars. So I don't want to put a, a number on what the net result is going to be on jobs. You know, you alluded to uh, commodity prices, so I'm going to ask you, is that potentially a big threat to the India growth story? And also, what do you believe are some of the other risk events that India should watch out for, particularly given, you know, anemic global trade and the world economy not looking so great? So commodity prices, uh, a lot of people think has kind of bottomed out and it would increase. Uh, I don't think it's a really big risk in the very near term because mm -hmm. for commodity prices to kind of go back up, you'd need uh, growth and you'd need global growth. Uh, and with the prediction for those being quite uh, poor, I mean, I don't really see this as a big near term risk for, for India. Mm -hmm. The bigger risks are the fact that the fact just the fact that global growth is weak. Yeah. Uh, the bigger risks are what's going to happen in the Eurozone, what's going to happen in UK when actual Brexit starts next year, uh, what's going to happen in Japan. I mean, these are the kind of the demand, where's the demand going to come from? Uh, there is a shift the interest to rates? No. In interest rates in the US, yes, I think that they will certainly, you know, probably have another, I shouldn't say certainly, but there's the likelihood that they will have an interest rate increase, but it's going to be small. Yeah. Uh, and if with India like signaling all the right things, it might not have such a big effect on, on, on the Indian economy. Uh, trade is something that people mention that you know the people that countries have become more protective, uh, but that's actually not the real reason why trade has slowed down. The trade has slowed down because investment in the world has slowed down by a lot, uh, and trade is a lot in investment kind of goods. Uh, and so I'm not so worried about protectionism as being a big problem for India. You're not. Okay, you're finally I have to ask you this because uh, your appointment as the advisor of the Kerala government qu stirred quite a big controversy. <laughs> I want to know how you're actually navigating the political economy uh, of a state that's pretty much a left bastion. I mean, what's been the experience so on? Um, <laughs> I was in Kerala uh, for a couple of days earlier this week and I had very good meetings with everybody and it was a very, very comfortable working environment. I am zero in terms of political savviness. I'm <laughs> just a pure technocrat. So I really hope I don't have to deal with anything of that kind. And again, again, to be clear, I mean, I have an advisory role. And so, yeah. you know, if... if how big do you believe uh, is the challenge ahead of Kerala, you know, in terms of plugging its infrastructure deficit at a time when it's so fiscally constrained, the remittance economy is pretty much uh, collapsed or is, you know, going down? How do you assess the Kerala picture? Uh, yes, yeah, so they do have, uh, you're right that they have an infrastructure deficit and the, this, this government is working on uh, addressing that. Uh, the Kerala economy is certainly dependent on the health of the Middle East. I mean, it's if you, if you correlate the growth rate of GDP in Kerala with the growth rate of GDP in, in the Middle East, it's positive and uh, you mm -hmm. know, it, it's important. Um, so yes, yeah, so those 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 issues those uh, issues exist. Uh, there are, there's a lot of effort being made in you know tax collection and making sure that the revenues go back up. Uh, so they're trying to address it at many different levels. I think they are quite cognizant of the importance of you know getting the fiscal side right. And you know there was some talk in the press about you having suggested some sort of a chili model for Kerala. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I would. <laughs> <laughs> prefer not to. It's something that I, uh, you know, that we started the discussion. We just, it was uh, something we, we talked about. I mean, you have to think through these things very carefully before making any big, any statement about it, and I would rather hold off. All right, finally, you know, if we're talking about the state of the India economy, let's say next year, in a couple of more years yes. from now, uh, what are some of the things that you'd wish would have changed? And realistically, how do you think the trajectory is looking like? Uh, so I, I mean, I would hope that this the government stays the course. Uh, there's always this concern that when as elections come, priorities change, and I hope that's not the case. I hope they continue. I hope they pay attention to the outcomes of a lot of the programs that they put in place, uh, Skill India, Make in India, uh, and fix wherever their problems are. Um, and and I really hope that they. Uh, continue to keep the RBI independent uh, and that interest rates are, you know, set by 
they buy you know what's best for in terms of the monetary environment in the country uh, because that's really a big part of the the optimism about India is the fact that it's shown itself to be responsible on the monetary side on the fiscal side and I hope yeah, are you happy that. with the current structure of the new monetary policy committee I mean has that given some sense of solace oh absolutely I think it's a very good committee and uh, you know I have no reason to question its independence all right Gita Gopinath pleasure speaking with you thank you